Hey team, Marty the OT Guy here, and we're back again for another session. Today, we're going to talk about um, the need to properly understand the limitations of automation or OT equipment when you're programming it. Um, in this case, what happens when you get memory management wrong? We're going to talk about what this device from last our last episode, what it was for. And over here on the lab, I've got a really cool challenge for this month. But also on top of that, we're going to show you how simple it is to build an Azomi Networks Guardian device. Stick around. Okay, so last month we started the first of our uh, lab challenge ideas, uh, lab challenges. So what I did was I grabbed a random piece of OT equipment that's lying around and hadn't been racked up in my lab yet um, and asked you if you could identify it. Well, here it is. This is the beast. Um, what is it? It is a Semaphore Kingfisher remote telemetry unit. And uh, well, particularly in my part of the world, these are really popular in, waste, in uh, water treatment. So drinking and wastewater, um, yeah, really, really popular. This is a particularly old model. The newer ones, um, they look different, they're much better. They definitely have more security built in mind. Um, and yeah, I'm still, <laughs> I still need to get off my butt and rack this up, add it into the lab so we can have a real play with it. But uh, to our two winners um, that managed to identify this, good on you, well done. And it was a pleasure sending you through some free stuff as a result. So, today's war story. So this one, um, this happened to me about, oh, it's about 17 years ago now. Um, I was working on a project in what's called a layered veneer lumber plant or LVL plant. And if you haven't run into this stuff before, layered veneer lumber, is uh, it's an engineered wood product for making uh, large beams used in buildings. Think plywood, but really big plywood. So to describe the process, at one end of the factory, you've got the, um, the peeler, which takes a log. It works like a pencil sharpener. It takes a log and it spins it and then inserts a blade and strips um, veneer off at about oh eighth of an inch, three millimeter, might as well say. And it strips the veneer off. Um, the veneer is cut, it is dried. And then it ends up at a place called the lay-up line, where they lay up the plywood. So if you're thinking normal, you know, three-ply, nine-ply, um, half-inch, whatever, plywood, you, you've got a sheet, and then you put another sheet, and another sheet, another sheet, another sheet. You press it, and, and that's your plywood. LVL is a bit different. Um, and on this particular line, it was a continuous production process, making a product that was eight feet wide, so 2.4 meters wide, um, by up to 200 millimeters thick, so yeah, eight, eight to 10 inches thick, call it. Um, and it, it just continually kept rolling 24 seven. So the uh, the team just kept applying glue and slapping wood on and, and the joins in the timber um, are staggered. So when they come to do a, um, a join, it's, it's not like we just cut it off and start again. It's a staggered join. It's really quite cool to watch actually. Um, so when you've got that much plywood, and you need to make sure that the glue sticks and, and how it all, you know, that it holds together, you need something pretty cool to, to put that pressure on. So there were two, two devices. Uh, one was a cold press. So just after it had been glued, before it all had a chance to separate and, and cause problems, it would go into a, a press stage where heavy weight would come down on top and, and it was uh, purely just weight. It was about, I think there were eight or 10, maybe 500 kg, possibly a ton one ton plates that came down and just sat on top of the timber and that would hold it um, for the 18 to 20 minutes that the next stage which was the hot press um, had to work so in in the hot press this thing is 20 meters long so 60 feet um, 20 meters long and you'd run 20 meters of timber in at once and it would come down with big hydraulic pressure um, i don't recall the pressure that they were exerting on the boards but it was big and then to add to it, um, at the, each plate that pressed down um, had a microwave transmitter in it. It, it. Same as your microwave oven in the kitchen. It had a oversized magnetron, if you like. Um, and each plate would push down and then they would microwave the timber for 20 minutes to set the glue. Um, and, and it's quite impressive. It came out probably at about 70 or 80 degrees Celsius, I suppose. It was quite hot, hot too, too hot to touch. Um, but perfectly put together. Anyway, it comes out of the hot press and then it comes to a cross-cut saw. And this cross-cut saw, you can imagine, you know, eight feet long, 10 inches thick, piece of wood comes out and you stop it, you cut 
and then you want to cut a specific length depending on what the customer had ordered. Well, when the factory was delivered from its, um, when the production line rather was delivered from its, uh, its factory where it was made, it had a tolerance on the crosscut saw of plus 10 minus 30 millimeters, which is not so much of a tolerance as much as, as an excuse as far as I'm concerned. Um, if you're asking it to cut a length at, at eight meters long, um, it could be anywhere between eight meters and, and, and 10, you know, three eighths of an inch, a, a finger width, to um, uh, long to uh, 7.75 sort of short. It was insane. It could be anywhere up to just over an inch, inch and three eighths short. Um, it was madness. So the customer asked me to re-engineer the control system and see if we could get tighter, um, tighter control. So we took a look at how this moved and you've got this big saw. Saw blades probably, it had to be, yeah, we'll call it the width of this screen, but it, it was a good four feet, five feet in diameter. It was big because it's got to cut easily through timber that's quite thick. Big saw, the saw traverses hor horizontally um, along a rack and pinion and um, electric brakes on the, the motor that caused the traversing motion. Um, there was a, a electromechanical brake. So we looked at it, we did some tests, and we found that if we fitted a rotary encoder to the, um, to the device, we could improve its accuracy. We gave the customer, I think we gave them plus or minus 10 mil was the, the best guess without trying. Um, and, and they took that, they were quite happy with that. So we went ahead and we installed all the gear and um, we tested and we found we actually got about plus or minus three millimeters. It was a fantastic project in that respect. But where it all went wrong was not having a deep understanding of the type of PLC that we were using. Um, yeah, that real, that's where it went wrong. And that's where uh, I learned how you turn a four foot or five foot circular saw blade into a shotgun. And we'll come back to that shortly. Okay, so lab test time. So here we are um, in my ESX client in my lab. Um, and we're going to build a virtual a virtual Nozomi Guardian. So you start off, create register of VM. It's, it's nothing unusual. And I should mention that it doesn't matter which hypervisor you're using. The process is pretty much the same, no matter no matter which one you use. So we supply the uh, the VM images as uh, OVA files. So let's do that. We need a name, the Guardian demo in this case. And I need the file. So I drag and drop the OVA file here. That's about all there is to do it. Uh, to it. Um, select the data store I want to put it in. Uh, select the network connection. So initially, I just want this in my VM network. Um, next. And then now we deploy. Now, the Guardian really needs a minimum of two um, two network connections. So you need one for management and you need one for spanning. So once this has done the deployment, we'll add the um, we'll add the spanning network connection. Okay, so the deployment's finished. The Guardian is switched off. So now what I need to do is um, is alter those next settings. So I go into edit here. You can see it's already got two adapters. So that's a start. Um, so I'll leave one on my VM network, um, which is my management network, and I'll drop the other into my lab mirror group. And now we power it on. Let it go through its boot. So we'll pop up here. All Guardians power up. They go through the same boot process. It doesn't matter whether it's virtual or physical. It's the same either way. Okay, so we're back now and we're at the login. So login for all demo machines. Admin. Oh, get my keys in there. There we go jump straight through and we come to a command prompt. First command, enable me. Then, uh, so now we're up and we're in escalated, um, escalated privileges, so we run setup. There we go there. First thing it's looking for is a new password. Make sure you use a good password, don't forget it, okay? Uh, even if it's a demo, still use a strong password because we do have um, there are some enforcements in there. So let's make it a good one. And repeat the password. 
and we're in the setup configuration, so pretty simple. Um, arrows up and down to move and enter to select. So start off with a host name. This is the default host name. Um, I tend to change that uh, so that I know what I'm looking at. Uh, we'll call it, actually we'll use all lowercase, vGuardian demo. Okay, and enter. We want to say yes to this. Uh, network interfaces, down again, one more. So this is where you need to have, uh, you already need to know what your IP address will be, your management IP address. And we're going to put that on EM0. So we'll go into EM0. We will, if we've got DHCP is disabled, so we'll go to the IP address and enter whatever IP address it is that you're going to use to manage this device on. Netmask is next. Whatever is appropriate for your for the subnet that you're managing it on. And that's about all we need to do. So we'll do save and exit here. I'd like to bring up the EM0 interface. Yes, I will. And exit. And when the setup is finished, as it goes through and does a few other, few you know, it's last minute setting up and restarts a few services, now it's saying go to the web console for additional setup. So we'll jump across to the web console just shortly. Okay, so what I've done here, I've opened a new tab and surfed to the IP address of the Guardian appliance that we've just created. In my case, 192.168.50.45. Login, first login, admin, and we have a standard default password, a default password that uh, all new devices come up with. It's, um, it's listed in the user documentation, so if you're not sure what it is, look there. Um, and if you're like me and you forget it every time you look there anyway, um, first thing you're asked to do, update the password. So we'll create, we'll make that change there. Nice of one password to come up with something I can't remember. Update and proceed. It will log me back out now. And then we log in again using that admin. And you'll see here, I've got an unlicensed tag up. Um, so this is where you need to contact Nozomi Networks, get a license. Or if you are doing this using the, um, the Community Edition, then as part of signing up for Community Edition, you get a license assigned that way. Um, until you license, the system's not going to work properly. But here we are, we've got a Guardian up and ready to go. Um, as you'll see, we've got no nodes. I've got nothing populating up on my graph. There's nothing happening here because we're not licensed. So I, uh, what you do rather, let's let's do this bit first. So you go to um, administration, system, updates and licenses. Now here we go, you can see I've got blank licenses for everything. I'm going to go away and insert my um, Nozomi training licenses, the our internal ones for demonstrating to people just like you. Um, I'm going to insert those licenses and activate this device, then we'll be right back. Okay, so I've been away and I've found my licenses. So I'm copying the license. I come over here, base license, set new license. I've already pasted it, look at that. Paste it in, verify and apply, and let it go away and think about that. So that license is active. My next one, threat intelligence license. Um, if you've purchased or you're testing Nozomi um, Networks appliances, you know, we might have shared a threat intelligence license with you. So you copy that, paste, Apply threat intelligence is up. And let's see, I've also got asset intelligence here as well. Copy asset intelligence, set new license. Verify and apply. Okay. Um, so it's telling us here we've got an error saying that it can't retrieve threat intelligence package version. It's because I haven't got it set up to connect um, to the outside world just yet. Let's come back to that. For the moment, let's see. Hey, look, now we've got some nodes and things. Check out our graph. Our graph is starting to populate. Um, that's it. It really is that simple. We've that, That's it. Start to finish, we've set up a virtual guardian. Um, it doesn't get much easier than this. And if you're in an environment where you're using a Vantage product where you can deploy virtual guardians just like this as you need them, it's really, really handy for whether it's troubleshooting or whether it's... Um, you know, experimenting how new places to attach things in the network to get better visibility. It's either way, it's a good thing. Um, 
yeah, this is a fantastic tool. Um, Nizomi Zomi Network's Guardian, it's a great thing. Um, I, hey, I'm biased, right? I work here. But um, yeah, whether you're using a Guardian or you're using Community Edition, it's a good place to start from. Just remember, when you're using the Community Edition, um, it does have a lot of features that are disabled and removed from the full version of the product. So um, yeah, don't have the same expectations, but it's still a useful tool if you need it. And it's great for around home. All right, so back with the war story. So part of the um, design of the system was we needed to build a recipe system where they could load, the, the customer, the, the factory users, could load in specified lengths of timber that they needed to cut off for a given shift or a run. Um, and then they could just execute the appropriate recipe for whatever was coming out of the high frequency press, out of the hot press. So we started looking um, looking at the PLC and the customer had said there isn't much memory left in the PLC or, or rather they said the manufacturer of the equipment said there's no memory left in the PLC. So first thing I did, jumped on the engineering workstation, logged into the PLC, memory check. There's over 50% spare. Um, this is, a, I think it was a 32K. Um, it's an old PLC. I'm not going to mention the name or manufacturer. Um, it's an, it was an old PLC at the time, not Ethernet capable. Um, but yeah, 32K, which was huge for the age of this thing. And over 16K was free. It was something like 18 or 19K free. It's, what are they saying? How can there be a memory issue? I don't understand. So um, yeah, so we go along and we... Um, we start looking at how we're going to implement this recipe system. So I'm looking at the way the memory is laid out, and you can see the 32-bit words laid out in the memory, and every second word had the bottom 16 bits used, and then the top 16 bits would be free, and the whole next word would be free. Um, and it was that pattern the whole way through the memory, through, through the usable memory, of course. And program memory is a bit different in those sorts of things, but... Through, through data memory, data memory block. It had that pattern. I couldn't work out why, and it made no sense. So I went through and I wrote my code, and we tested it. Uh, the customer was able to give me a spare PLC. We tested on the bench. We made sure everything worked. It was a beautiful thing. We went and did the install. So we installed the recipe system, and we ran, and in, in all tests, the device worked perfectly, absolutely perfectly. And then um, I went to go back to my hotel one night and I was just about to drive out the gate of the factory and they came running out like, Marty, 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 stop, stop. We've had a problem. Something's gone wrong. Okay. So you go back in and all I saw was the end result, which was a piece of board that had come out um, of, the, of the hot press, hadn't quite got to where it should be on the crosscut saw. The crosscut saw had managed to move itself to a forbidden cut zone. So you can imagine when this uh, board comes out of the of the hot press, it comes along a series of rollers, rolls along a series of rollers, um, stops, and then you have a cut zone. And where there is a steel roller, it's not a good idea to drop the saw and, and cut, but that's what had happened. So the saw had moved itself directly over top of a 150 millimeter steel roller, spun up, dropped down, and then cut into this roller. Um, and at that point, the two or 300 carbide tips that were on every, uh, or rather the, the carbide tips that were on the two or 300 teeth around the saw had decided that they didn't want to be saw blade tips anymore and they flew off the saw blade at high speed, um, went across the factory and peppered themselves into stacks of wood. And that was the shotgun effect. So you can imagine these carbide tips are about five millimeters square by about eight to 10 millimeters long and they're sharp, they're sharpened. Um, and you have, I'm guessing on the number of teeth, but for a saw that size, two to 300 teeth would be a minimum, I think. So there was, yeah, a couple of hundred, two or 300 of these teeth came off in under a second and just went flying across the factory and embedded into the wall. But holy crap. Start looking at the PLC code, could not find a way to replicate the problem. I sat there that night, I think it was about 5 p.m. I think I went back to my hotel at about 3 a.m. the next morning, just sitting, looking, looking, going, what is going on, watching every step of the sequence. It never happened, never happened, never happened. Okay, so the next day, came in after a few short hours of sleep and a, um, some food and 
We checked it again, no problem, no problem. Got in my car, went to head away again. Uh, got about an hour away from site, got a phone call. It's done it again. Turn around, go back. Spent that night sitting there looking, looking. What is going on? What is going on? Couldn't replicate it. Same thing happened the third night in a row. Couldn't replicate it. Um, and at this point, I was lost. I was at an absolute loss, and the customer was fuming um, because the last time that it had gone off, that it had done this and gone off, um, someone was walking past the machine when the saw did the cut, and they were thankfully, thankfully, they were wearing safety glasses, hard hat, overalls, everything. They just got hit in the side by this wave of flying cardboard that came out of the machine. Um, that morning, the next morning, a massive piece of sheet of Lexan was put in front of the machine, was fitted to the machine to stop that happening again. And it continued to happen for a couple more days. And we couldn't work it out. We're reading the PLC manuals, we're trying to understand what's going on, trying to work out what's happening. And then I came back one morning and I get a message that says, you need to go and see the electrical engineers now. So we rocked up to the electrical workshop and one of the guys is standing there and in one hand, he's got the English version of the manual and in the other hand, he has a foreign language version of it. And what it turns out, and this is the key lesson here, in this particular PLC, if you enable a certain type of maths, which I'm pretty sure was floating point, if you enable floating point maths, out of every two 32-bit words, you can only use the bottom 16 bits of the first word because the top 16 bits are flags um, for calculations and the following word in memory becomes a scratch pad. And that scratch pad may or may not be used depending on the calculation that's addressing the, the previous memory register, may or may not be used. So we had uh, out of the probably 150 to 200 registers that I'd used, memory locations I'd used, there was one, one memory location that when down at the layout line, they pressed a certain sequence of buttons and did a certain um, change in process to do with the layering. It triggered a calculation. The calculation triggered one of the bits in the upper 16-bit block, which started the saw, and then the following word was the set point that the saw was to move to. And this calculation from the other end of the machine would insert a value into that set point, which happened to line up perfectly, with a six inch steel roller. So when they did this particular function on the machine at, and everything, all the ducts lined up at once, all the holes in the Swiss cheese were aligned, um, this saw would start spinning, it would move right over top of the six inch roller, drop down, cut through it and shotgun everybody. And in the end, what we had to do um, was, I had to go back and rework just about the whole project. Um, I think we had promised the customer 40 recipe slots. Um, and by the time we'd gone through and tested every possible combination of, um, of, of which memory we could use and which memory we couldn't, uh, I think we wound up being able to give them 18 or maybe 20 at the most um, rec usable recipe slots. The moral of the story was this. The explanation about how that memory was mapped and used only existed in the foreign language version of the manual. It did not exist in the English language version. So it was only a sheer fluke that one of the electrical engineers spoke this particular, or could read and write this particular language and was able to read that manual and compare word for word against the English one and find the difference. That's, what, that's how we solved the problem. So the message there is, um, you know, there can be some very strange and unusual um, capabilities or functions within some of this gear. And this wasn't an un, this isn't an unknown brand. This wasn't some backyard homemade PLC. This is a major major manufacturer. Um, but yeah, that was one hell of a learning curve. And thankfully, the guy who got hit in the side with the um, flying carbide tips, he had a couple of scratches on one cheek. Um, his hard hat had a few dings, and he had a couple of tears in his overalls, and that was all. But that was one scary moment. <laughs> Down here on the breadboard, I've got this month's challenge. So this circuit is made up of two parts, and I have three questions for you. First question, what do you think the two parts of this circuit are? What are their functions? Second question, 
The two parts of the circuit, each function, is controlled by a separate integrated circuit. These are standard ICs, I'm not using anything, anything tricky here. But uh, second question is, what do you think the ICs might be that control the circuit? Third question, the, the overall function of the circuit has applications in computer engineering and also in industrial process control. What do you think the applications might be in those fields? What we'll do is we'll take a look at the, uh, the best answers. The person who comes up with the most accurate answers um, will get free swag. Now we'll cut shortly. I'll give you a close up of what the circuit's doing and also what's happening on the oscilloscope to help you work it out. Hey, it's Marty here. Don't forget to leave a comment. Tell me what you want to see in our video content. Like and subscribe. Share this with your friends and colleagues. Thanks. See ya.